Hi again, and welcome back. Let's talk about the respiratory system and the pleural membranes and pressures and pneumothorax for this lecture. So the pleural membranes are serous membranes, epithelial membranes uh, around the lungs. So there is a visceral layer and a parietal layer similar to what we saw with the pericardial membrane. So the visceral layer is attached to the viscera, attached to the lungs. And then we have a parietal layer or parietal pleural membrane. Singular is pleura. And then there is a potential space between the two. Now it's a potential space, this pleural space. It's there in theory. In actuality, the two membranes are fairly well stuck together. And this is key to understanding how the lungs expand. So let's go through this in class. In, during the lecture, I often uh, do this demonstration. I take two glass plates. You could think of glass microscope slides. So maybe something like this. That's a plate of glass. We're looking at it on edge. And then I take another microscope slide, a plate of glass, again, looking at it on edge. And then I take uh, some liquid, usually just water, but we could think of it in terms of plural fluid. And I splot a couple of drops of water on the bottom slide. And then I put the two slides together. It's an arrow. And then what I have is... one slide, and then the other slide attached to it, stuck together. And the pleural fluid, of course, is between the two. And those two glass plates are stuck together. And the pleural fluid is lubricating, so the slides can move. You know, they slip around, and if you're not careful, I'll dro I drop them. I haven't yet in class, but there's that potential. So they slide, like the pleural membranes on the lungs. They slide against the thoracic wall. And if I pick up on one, I lift that slide. So I'm holding on to this slide at this end. And if I lift that slide, the other one goes with it. They're stuck together. So if I lift the top one, the bottom one comes with it. And that idea is what's going on at the lungs. So the skeletal muscles are expanding the rib cage and pulling the parietal pleural membrane outward. And the visceral pleural membrane, just like the microscope slides, are stuck with it, and it moves also. And that's how the lungs are inflated. Okay. The figure on the left just shows more of the anatomy. Again, here is the visceral and the parietal pleural membrane, and there's a, a potential space between the two. Next slide uh, does a little bit more of this with um, the pleural membranes. And, uh, okay, so let's start with the uh, expansion of the rib cage requires inspiratory skeletal muscles. We've already talked about that to overcome natural recoil of the chest and lungs. So the rib cage has elastic cartilage in it, and it takes effort to expand that rib cage. We've talked about this numerous times. It's an active process. 
and you need to stretch those elastic fibers that are on the alveoli. We looked at that earlier in sort of the microanatomy of the alveoli. They're wrapped with these elastic fibers. You need to stretch those literally like a rubber band. So keeping that in mind, you have this tension that develops. You have the skeletal muscles that are wanting to expand the rib cage, and they do. And the elastic recoil on the alveoli, those elastic fibers are stretched, and they always want to collapse. It's like a rubber balloon. If you inflate a rubber balloon before you tie the knot in it, if you let go of it, the natural elastic fibers in the rubber material contract and squeezes the air out. So we always have this tension between recoil, that doesn't show up all that well, so this is the elastic recoil that wants to collapse the lungs. And this outward expansion creates this tension. So the tension between the two membranes creates a partial vacuum. So, again, in lecture, in a real class, I mean, this is a real class, but in a traditional lecture class, not in line, I can pull out um, a large syringe, which I do, I have a 60 cc or 60 mil syringe, and makes a nice demo. So I want to um, sort of explain this vacuum idea. It's uh, important for the next slide. So let's imagine that this is our syringe. There's the barrel of it. And let's say here's the plunger. Sort of something like that. And here's the little handle. And right now, Imagine that the plunger is open and air goes in and air can go out. And we're not moving the plunger. So the atmosphere, the pressure in here, inside, is the same as outside. Then, if we close this off and sort of trap it, we still have air pressure in the chamber of the syringe, which is the same as the atmospheric pressure because we have not changed the volume. However, with this closed off now, let's draw the same syringe after we move the barrel, or the plunger rather. And this is where we originally were. And let's move the plunger back to here now. So applying Boyle's law, so this moved in this direction. What happened to the volume in the chamber? Well, the volume obviously increased, and what happened to the pressure? Well, it went down. So the pressure now in the chamber is less than what we started with in the atmosphere. So the pressure is less than atmosphere or less than zero. We tend to talk in terms of relative pressure because if we said atmospheric pressure all the time, well, you know, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure changes as you go up or down from sea level. And we don't want to keep adjusting for it. So we just say it's relative to zero. So the pressure will be less than Zero to be a negative pressure with expansion. So this is the condition that's always um, occurring in the lungs between these two pleural membranes. So again, this picture, you can think of it as what's going on at those two membranes. So, oh, this was closed off still. So this would represent one membrane if you will, and this could represent the other. And this would be the plural space between the two. 
and there's this tension. The pull on the elastic fibers in one direction, the pull of the rib cage in the other. Since there's always that tension between the two, the pressure in that chamber or in that space is always a little bit negative. So that takes us to the next slide. Discussing basically the same thing. So let's start with um, the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure. So the number that's usually given is at sea level. So this you need to remember, 760 millimeters of mercury. At sea level, under standard conditions of temperature, humidity, etc. And as you go up in altitude, top of Mount Rainier or over Snoqualmie Pass or White Pass, the atmospheric pressure decreases. So it's not going to be 760 millimeters of mercury in Yakima because we're not at sea level. So it'll be a little bit less. But nonetheless, you need to remember 760. It's thrown out all the time. Okay. So we've already kind of talked about this. If the airway is patent, which means open, so if we have a patent airway and the volume is not changing, then the intrapulmonary pressure within the lungs is 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level again. Okay? So that's the intrapulmonary pressure. Intra, inside lungs. If we look at the, we've already talked about this upper left box and the tension that exists between the pleural membranes and the partial vacuum. And the intrapleural pressure between those two membranes in that space that we just looked at in the previous slide is always less than the intrapulmonary pressure. It's the partial vacuum. So it's not going to be 760 millimeters of mercury in that space. It's going to be less than. So ballpark figure, let's say, for example, it's 756. Now again, we're not going to keep throwing about these specific numbers because they all change when you go up or down in sea level. But the difference between the two is pretty constant. So if we went with 760 at sea level minus the intrapleural pressure, that we get a difference of 0.4. And that's our partial vacuum. So what you need to remember is that it's approximately minus 4. And it is always negative. It's always less than atmospheric pressure. That's important to remember. It's always going to be slightly negative relative to atmosphere. Okay? So, we'll come back to that when we talk about a pneumothorax. But let's go to the next slide. And before we get to it, what it's going to be looking at, the tricky part in the next slide is this piece, this intrapleural pressure. So remember how we got it. So the next slide, 
Okay, we're not going to freak out and light our hair on fire, even though it looks a little confusing, maybe. Break it down. What do you already know? Spend a couple minutes. Maybe it takes 10 minutes to figure this out. But we've already done this part. So what is this showing? Well, it's just showing the volume of air moved. And we're back to our magic 500. So this is our tidal volume. It goes up, it goes down, up and down. Okay. So we've done that. And that's the pressure, or the volume rather, inside the lungs. Another one that we've already looked at is the top panel. And what this shows is the alveolar pressure. Again, relative to atmosphere. And we've already talked about, this is Boyle's Law here. So as the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. As the volume gets smaller during expiration, the pressure goes up. So we've already done that curve. So that should make sense. If you need to go back and look at the previous slide, that's okay. And this is the new one. And this is the intrapleural pressure between those two membranes that we we're just looking at. And there's our minus four. So this panel is showing the intrapleural pressure. Notice that it's always negative. We're going from about minus three to about minus six. And minus four is somewhere in between. And that's the pressure, the partial vacuum, the negative pressure that's between the membranes that we are just looking at. So think about uh, the tension and the expansion of the plunger in the syringe. So as you expand the lungs more. Let me back up to the previous slide for a second. Oops, another slide. So during a full expansion of the lungs, we are pulling on the plunger harder. And that will create a greater distance, a greater volume, and that will cause the pressure to go down even more. So, check this out. Relating the middle panel to the bottom. So, where is the volume the greatest? Well, the volume in the lungs is the greatest right there. The lungs are expanded fully at that point. They're stretched out to 500 milliliters. That's the greatest tension. That's where the pressure is the most negative. And you're holding it. So if I can sort of demonstrate, if I take a full breath and expand the ribs and hold it there, it's like I'm pulling back on that syringe even harder. And I'm maintaining it while I'm holding my maintaining the full inhalation. So if I go and I hold it, the skeletal muscles are still expanding the rib cage. You're still pulling on that plunger, if you will, and the vacuum is going negative. As I exhale, I let go, the tension decreases, and then after I've exhaled, there's still tension between those two membranes, but it's less than it was. And on the figure, where is the pressure the least? Well, it's least here at about minus three when the volume is the least. So play around with that. It should be able, you should be able to make sense out of it and be able to explain it.
Okay, the next couple of slides is sort of a change of pace and looking at uh, a couple of terms and then some microanatomy. So lung elastance and lung compliance, two terms you need to be familiar with. Elastance is pretty straightforward. It's just uh, dealing with the elastic fibers in the alveoli. So this is the ability of the alveoli to expand and contract like a rubber balloon. That's healthy. That's normal. Compliance is another concept, which is how easily the lungs are able to expand. And uh, in a normal, healthy lung, there's a certain amount of elastance and a certain amount of compliance. So compliance deals with how easily it is for the lungs to expand. If lungs have low compliance, that means that they're relatively stiff and they have difficulty inflating. Conditions like scar tissue in the lungs can reduce lung compliance. If they have high compliance, they're very easy to inflate. A loss of elastic fibers in the lungs will increase lung compliance. It's easy to inflate the lungs, but it's difficult to expel the air because you are relying on the elastance to collapse the lungs. So if they have low compliance, they've probably lost elastic tissue, and then it's difficult to ex expel the air which brings us to emphysema. In emphysema, there's my altered microanatomy. I'll show you a slide in just a moment of the alveoli. There's a loss of elastic tissue. So we have high compliance and low elastance. High compliance, the lungs are easy to inflate. Low elastance means it's difficult to expel the air. Again, a sort of in-class uh, demo is blowing up a rubber balloon and blowing up a, pre a plastic bread bag. So to blow up a balloon, it takes some effort. You have to overcome that elastic recoil in the balloon. But when you let go, the balloon collapses easily and expels the air. On a bread bag, plastic bread bag, similar or analogous to what the lungs are like with emphysema, it's very easy to inflate a plastic balloon or a plastic bread bag. You just blow into it, the bag inflates, but you've lost the elastic fibers and it's difficult to get the air out. So, elastance and compliance and emphysema. And this figure shows lung tissue. Let's start with a, a normal lung on the right. I am presuming that the magnifications of these two slides or these two images is comparable. It wasn't given though in the illustration that I copied this from. But the idea on the right, normal lung, lots of alveoli, lots of surface area for gas exchange. So we're talking about all these little surfaces. You add all of those up together and it all sums to a large surface area for the gas exchange. And we looked at that in an earlier slide in those respiratory membranes. And there are intact elastic fibers. So the lung retains its natural elastance and normal compliance. That's good. That's a nice healthy lung. Emphysema. Loss of the alveoli, the alveoli are damaged. We lose the surface area and we wind up with larger air spaces. In the lungs and we've lost all the little alveolar clusters that were in the lungs. Those are all gone. We have these big blown out plastic bread bag looking lungs. So all of that's gone. So the surface area is down. We've lost the elastic recoil of those alveoli and it's what an emphysemic lung looks like. Not efficient at gas exchange 
and it's there's no repair it's permanent damage cigarette smoking is a leading cause of emphysema but there are some unfortunate individuals that have emphysema that have never smoked sort of a genetic component to that as well unfortunately the last slide in this set goes back to the intrapleural pressures so we took a break from it for a minute we're going to conclude with pneumothorax. So start with the normal picture on the left. And you know that there's a little bit of a vacuum here. So that pressure, so that intrapleural pressure is always less than atmosphere. Okay, and we are able to pull the, inflate the lungs just like pulling on those two glass slides. Okay, we've been over that. A pneumothorax, uh, you know, I guess uh, maybe Yakima in the night of the week. Um, knife injury, bullet injury, penetrating trauma to the chest cavity pokes a hole in the membrane. And air then is able to rush in. So what we're doing is back to the normal lung, we're poking a hole here, and then air can enter, remember this is atmospheric pressure, and it's greater than the pressure in that intrapleural space. So the air rushes in, and fills that space. Now we've lost that tension. And the elastic recoil on the lungs causes the lungs to pull in on themselves, which is what we have on the right. So this is our intrapleural space that is greatly expanded. So this is a pneumothorax. Pneumo for air and thorax for the chest cavity. So air in the chest cavity where you're not supposed to have air and the lung collapses. So a pneumothorax is not the term for technically for a collapsed lung. That's another term, atelectasis. But pneumothorax is the air in here. And that's got to be removed so that the lung can be reinflated. And you should also think about what a hemothorax is. Do the same thing. If blood would get into that space. So that's the end of that lecture. The next one will calculate some pulmonary and alveolar ventilation rates. So. Study this material and identify, uh, keep working at it, and keep practicing on what you don't know. What you do know, great, move on. Ask questions when you have them, please.